The Roman conquest of the Mediterranean seems almost inevitable when viewed with 2020 hindsight. The empire inexorably expanding its borders until coming to rest along various natural frontiers. But it didn't have to be this way. History is never so deterministic. Sometimes, just a few, relatively small changes can ultimately change the fate of civilizations. The Roman campaigns into Germania are one such fascinating scenario to consider through this lens. Today, let us explore the reasons why conquests failed and how Rome ultimately adapted. The Roman experience in Germania provides a great case study on ancient geopolitics along border regions. I love learning about these sorts of topics, and I'm always hungry to find out more. Thankfully, our sponsor Blinkist has a solution. Blinkist is an app that puts the vast library of human history at your fingertips. What's more, it takes thousands of nonfiction books and uses experts to distill them down to their most essential ideas for you to easily digest with text or audio in just 15 minutes. It's been a great tool for me to explore a wide range of topics from the 27 sections offered by Blinkist. As a great example, I was recently able to listen to The Lessons of History by Will and Ariel Durant, which tracks the changes of humanity in matters of morality, religion, government systems, economics, and war. I also finally got to enjoy the fascinating work Politics by Aristotle, which discusses the nature of this age-old field. It's a book I've long wanted to read but never got around to. I'm sure that when you try Blinkist, you will also be able to explore many hidden gems of your own. So check it out now by clicking the link in the description below to get a 7 day free trial. In addition, the first 100 people will get 25% off a full membership. Enjoy! Let's start by putting things in their historical context. The Roman-Germanic Wars extended far beyond the duel of fates between Arminius and Germanicus which we recently covered. That was but one chapter of a saga which dated back hundreds of years. The first chapter began in the late 2nd century BC when a series of tribes migrated into the sphere of Roman influence, first clashing with foreign allies before coming to blows with the legions themselves. Eventually Marius and a reformed Roman army was able to beat them back, but it had been a bloody affair with Germanic tribes mostly taking the offense. This power projection beyond the north would be a recurring feature throughout antiquity. Most of this activity though goes unrecorded until, like a stone cast into a lake, its ripples arrive at the feet of observers along the shorelines of recorded civilization. The second chapter took place as Rome's presence extended into Gaul. Here they would uncover a convoluted geopolitical dance taking place between the various tribes to either side of the Rhine. It is into this churning mess that Julius Caesar happily waited in search of conquest that would elevate his career. Among the numerous battles of this period, he clashed with the Germanic forces of King Ariovistus west of the Rhine, before later mounting a raid east of the Great River. Though this first offensive amounted to little more than a publicity stunt, it would be a prelude of things to come. The third chapter of the Germanic Wars occurred in the 20s BC, as Rome sought to solidify its more recent conquests after years of being distracted by civil war. In Gaul, it proved clear that Germanic raiding and support of rebellious factions was a threat to the region. Thus, Rome set about establishing a series of forts and garrisons to protect their investment west of the Rhine. Yet even still, tensions had continued to escalate, eventually resulting in the 17 BC execution of captured Roman soldiers who had begun to operate beyond the Rhine. Shortly thereafter, Germanic warbands crossed in force, defeating the 5th legion and humiliating them with the capture of their eagle. Though the border was resecured, it was clear more proactive measures had to be taken. The fourth chapter of the Germanic Wars involved Rome's first attempts to establish a zone of control beyond the Rhine. The Empire's playbook for such affairs was fairly standardized by this point. Amass provisions, mobilize an army, charge at the nearest power center, steamroll any opposition, install new administrators, extract profits, squash the inevitable revolts, and repeat. The first man to be granted this honor in 13 BC would be Drusus the Elder. For four years, he launched both land and sea expeditions against the nearest border tribes. Here, the legions proved victorious, winning many battles, with Drusus reportedly even dueling several enemy kings in combat. The momentum of this assault carried Roman arms all the way to the Weser and later the Elbe. It was a promising start that was only marred by the premature death of Drusus following a riding accident. Yet this was no matter. Honors were paid in his respect, and a new replacement was found his brother and heir to the throne, the great general Tiberius. He got the agenda of conquest back on track with a new round of campaigning. For two years, these pushed up to the Elbe, retreading many of the recently bloodied fields. For the time being, it seemed that open resistance by the tribes had been greatly reduced. 
The playbook therefore dictated that it was time to install new administrators and begin extracting profits. With such plans in motion, it proved easy for imperial propaganda to proclaim that the region had effectively been pacified and was well on the way to becoming a new province. Yet the reality on the ground was far more dire. Revolts of some kind were to be expected at this stage, but it seemed the harder the legions pushed, the more resistance they encountered. Eighteen more years of intermittent campaigning passed. Boys grew into manhood, and a new normal was established. Rome claimed the region was pacified, while the Germanic tribes merely gave lip service to this idea, largely dodging or ignoring the rule of this theoretical government. The fifth chapter of the Germanic Wars involved a sudden upset of the steady state world. The inciting incident was the Illyrian Revolt which drew off Roman forces from the region, creating a power vacuum that disrupted the status quo. As had happened many times before, the various factions quickly reacted to this imbalance. Some cast their lot with the Romans or chose to wait things out, while others saw this as a chance to establish themselves at the top of the local pecking order. Among the oldest and loudest proponents of resistance were those of the Carusi. In 9 AD, one of their sons, the auxiliaryman Arminius, masterminded a move to secure a new future for his people. A coalition of tribes was forged in secret and together struck the Romans all at once. They massacred the dispersed garrisons and then ambushed the main body at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, wiping out the three full legions which had been assigned to keep the peace in Germania. Roughly 20 years of imperial progress had been wiped out in the blink of an eye. Worse yet, the disaster shattered the aura of invincibility that had surrounded the Roman army and allowed them to strong arm so many peoples into submission. It was as if a kid had finally shoved back the bully and sent him stumbling to the ground. The implications of this were huge. Soon, many others across Romania felt empowered, but news traveled fast. How long until the rest of the empire's victims heard of this? This fear, in addition to the outcry from the public, spurred Rome into action. It did so with the mindset of a true bully, lashing out with a punch against the one who had pushed them so hard as to dissuade all onlookers from ever even thinking of attempting such a thing. The sixth chapter of the Germanic Wars would be defined by this punitive objective. For two years Tiberius led methodical, retaliatory campaigns to re-establish Rome's footing along the Rhine. However, the real fighting would come when he retired to attend matters at home, passing on command to his nephew. This son of the deceased Drusus, later known as Germanicus, would carry out a hellish series of campaigns against the Germanic tribes, soaking the bogs with the blood of those who had dared to oppose the empire. Yet every year seemed to begin the same. Spring saw the rising Roman tide come in with fresh offensives, only to recede once again in the winter as barbarian steel and northern chill harried them back to the Rhine. For every great victory came an equivalent disaster or near catastrophe. Sure, the high watermark of each yearly cycle yielded some gains, but the body count was rising rapidly on both sides. Maintaining this strategy of attrition proved hugely expensive and extremely risky. It is for this reason that after the climactic battle of the Angravarian Wall in 16 AD and the disaster at sea which followed, Emperor Tiberius called an end to the madness, writing, quote, Rome has taken her vengeance, let them be abandoned to their internal squabbling. It had been nearly 40 years of conflict, a total higher than stacking the US Vietnam War atop the war in Afghanistan. Put in this context, you can hopefully appreciate the longevity of this multi generational conflict. So, why did it ultimately fail? First and foremost, we could point to the staunch defense of its people, whose bravery and ingenuity kept the legions at bay for so long. There is also the matter of the local geography and weather, which hampered mobility in the region and punished the long supply lines of any would-be invader. But it seems evident that even with such grit and advantages of the terrain, the military odds were still stacked against them. So again, why did the Romans fail? The most basic reason, and the one argued by Germanicus, was that the Romans simply needed more time. Give the legions just one more year and it was mission accomplished. This seems to be the refrain of nearly all military commanders who have been caught in similar quagmires across the ages. Yet, given how much time Rome had already dedicated to the region and the lessons learned from later history, it's hard to believe victory could be achieved in such a short time. But come on, this was the greatest military power of its age, surely it could have afforded at least a few more years. This is a point worth discussing. It seems that there are some larger trends and circumstantial factors which prove limiting to the timeline in Germania. The first point is that Rome did not have infinite resources. 
In fact, its vast empire was stretched quite thin, with military units constantly fighting across multiple fronts. These could be pooled and redeployed to meet various threats as they came up. But locking legions down in a theater of war with heavy attrition for an extended period of time would mean that the empire would be dangerously exposed on other fronts. For instance, the Dacians constantly contested Roman hegemony along the Danube. Parthia was a perpetual threat on the eastern border, not to mention the turbulent province of Judea. Ethiopia regularly tested Roman limits south of Egypt, and the city of Alexandria was so notoriously restless that two legions had to be constantly deployed to the city just to maintain the regularity of the grain supply. You might think that Rome could simply dig deeper into its vast manpower reserves. However, this seems to have been easier said than done. For instance, after the outbreak of the Great Illyrian Revolt and the disaster at Teutoburg, Augustus had a frantic time raising troops reportedly taking drastic steps to force people into the army, which even included conscripting a slave levy. This sort of manpower shortage would continue to be an issue in the imperial era of the professional army, for reasons we won't have time to get into in this video. But even if you could get more boots on the front lines, they also had to be fed and supplied. The larger the force, the more hungry it became. Such a voracious appetite drained the local territory and logistics network meant to support the army, once again putting the Empire at risk of any unexpected disasters that might emerge, and potentially even triggering fresh revolts by asking too much of the people. In addition, some of the more circumstantial factors limiting the Roman timeline in Germania included imperial politics. For instance, when Tiberius called for the end of the fighting in the north, some ancient historians blamed his jealousy of Germanicus. Such speculation is hard to confirm, but may have been possible. At the time Tiberius was about 60 years old, and increasingly the politics of succession were coming into play. Perhaps the recall of Germanicus was not malicious, and instead his efforts were considered better spent elsewhere across the realm, getting the people acquainted with the future heir. After all, he did end up on a victory tour across the east, so perhaps this was the calculus being made. Alternatively, it may have been simply that Tiberius was more willing to rip off the band-aid than Augustus had been, and took the early years of his reign to end the conflict on a relatively high note. Either way, it seems that Germania was simply taking backseat to other imperial priorities. But why was it such a low priority? This mainly comes down to the pros and cons of the conflict. On the list of the pros was the security it gave Gaul, the propaganda value of great victories, and the spoils of war. On the cons, however, were the drains to resources we previously mentioned, the ephemeral nature of progress, and the strategic risk it posed for an empire stretched thin. This simply wasn't penciling out. But again we might ask why. Why was the price of war so high and the reward so low? This is really the meat of what I wanted to discuss and the key to understanding the conflict. In large part, it has to do with the nature of Germanic civilization in this period. It was highly decentralized with many factions and few urbanized centers of power. These tribes were as rambunctious as the Greek city-states had ever been. Alliances could shift on a weekly basis, and the current king of the hill was almost always dethroned by a coalition of those below. In addition, if you were to kill one man, now his brothers, cousins, and even the tribe would be at your throat, further dragging out any conflicts and driving a wedge into ideas of unity. In addition, the so-called barbarian northerners shared few cultural bonds with the conqueror and were decades if not centuries away from being yoked into a state of submission like the Greeks had been. This all made for a very fluid environment, one which churned endlessly and proved a poor foundation atop which to build a stable province. And even if a province could be established atop the shifting bogs of Germania, extracting profits would be quite hard. This was usually done by levying taxes on a population or pillaging its natural resources. The low urban density and the remoteness of the lands though would make both of these endeavors quite difficult without significant investment. Sure, Rome could in the words of Tacitus make a wasteland and call it peace, but was that really worth the huge amounts of blood and treasure such a feat would require? What Rome really salivated over was the chance to install itself atop a well-oiled cash machine and suck it dry. This was in essence what the eastern provinces represented, lands of huge population with lots of urban centers linked by flourishing trade routes that had long become used to paying tithe to one empire or another. The governance was easy. All Rome had to do was roll in with the legions, knock out the kingpin, take up the crown for itself, and count the money rolling in. This was done by way of governors who really stayed quite hands-off in their management, 
let the locals do as they please, so long as they paid up and kept the peace. This approach is what allowed the East to bankroll the empire for centuries. Even in the West, the once barbarian Gaul became a quite lucrative province. This was only possible because compared to Germania, it had a far more tameable landscape, with higher levels of pre-existing urban development and a populace that had a long history of prior exchange with Rome. Yet even still, it had taken the near genocidal campaigns of Caesar, coupled with massive investments in infrastructure to get it to this point. Germania was a different beast entirely. So if this frontier was not ready for outright conquest, was there a better way? This was certainly a question which was asked by the shot callers of ancient Rome. Their solution was to stop bashing their heads against the wall. Thus, Roman armies were replaced with Roman diplomats. These were dispatched to the leaders of every tribe. In public, their purpose was to open relations, forging bonds of friendship and commerce to the benefit of all. To some degree, this was genuine. Over the years, Rome would establish a series of allies, partners, and client states across the Rhine who filled imperial coffers and contributed reliable manpower to the legions. However, it seems that a more subtle game was afoot. In a similar manner to how the Persians handled the Greeks after their failed invasion, diplomacy was used as a weapon. Favor and gold would be plied to keep the tribes forever at each other's throat, prodding them to tear each other apart more effectively than the Romans ever could. Thus distracted, the tribes had far less time or incentive to attack an empire which kept its armies off to the sidelines of their affairs. Raids and small conflicts did of course still occur, but their frequency was greatly reduced. They typically only flared up when Rome appeared weak or when one faction in Germania grew too powerful. The empire handled the former by maintaining a strong border presence of troops and fortifications along the Rhine, while handling the latter with the projection of soft power. This approach proved far more effective in securing Roman aims than the wars ever had been. In fact, it worked so well that it would be another 150 years until another major war broke out with the Germanic nation. With peace and stability now achieved, lucrative trade resumed, the interior provinces prospered, and Rome could turn its attention to other matters and fresh conquests elsewhere. There is certainly much more we could discuss when it comes to the ancient geopolitics and history of this region, but for now, this is where we will end the episode. Do you think that Rome could have conquered Germania? How would you have done things differently? And if it had succeeded, do you think it could have changed the fate of the empire? Let me know in the comments below. A huge thanks to the patrons for funding the channel, and to the researchers, writers, and artists for making this episode possible. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content, and check out these other related episodes. See you in the next one.